3rd John. We'll begin reading verse number 1. The elder, that's John himself, unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for the good singing. Our hearts have been uplifted. Lord, I'm thankful we're going to that marriage land. Thankful we've been adopted into the family of God. We've been born into the family of God. One day we'll be married into the family of God. God, I'm glad I don't have to worry about dying and going to hell. I'm glad, Lord, you took my place on Calvary. Lord, you bled and died and became the propitiation for my sins. Uh, look, Lord, you took the handwriting and ordinances that were contrary to me and nailed them to your cross. Uh, Lord, you took my sin upon yourself when you became our sacrifice and our substitute. Lord, you died and you went to... Uh, was buried, rose again the third and pointed day according to the scriptures and Lord took our death, our hell and our sin and God I'm glad I don't have to worry about going to hell because I've been born again Amen. Lord I pray Father for those Lord within a stone's throw this place that are headed to hell Lord I pray that we'd be a lighthouse to this community and God, we'd win as many as we can before your imminent return. God, I certainly do pray, Lord, as we look across the globe and what's going on and how this earth is spinning out of course and how, Lord, the Bible's being fulfilled right before our very eyes. Uh, Lord, I pray that, Lord, we'd be busy about the Father's business and we'd see many come to Christ in these days. Lord, I do pray. Lord, for Israel, I pray for the peace of Israel. I pray that you'd protect her. And God, Lord, your hand would be with her in this very hour. Father, I pray that, Lord, uh, uh, as we see folks that are rising up and rebelling against Israel, that, Lord, your children would, Lord, become broken. Lord, because we realize that the church is just... Uh, a branch that's been grafted into the true vine. And God, we know that Israel was your chosen people. And Lord, we realize that, Lord, in this day of the Gentiles and this day of grace, that they have to get born again just like us. Uh, but God, we do know that your promises to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, uh, Moses and the prophets are still your promises and they're still true today. And I pray for Israel. Father, I pray for Miss Mary. You touch her and help her tonight. I pray for Brother Adrian, Miss Nancy's uh, son Joe that had surgery, that, Lord, you'd help him to recover and that all would be well. Father, I pray for Brother Ed that has to have surgery on Friday. You'd be with him. Lord, we're thankful Miss Carol got to come home, and I pray you'd continue to help her. Lord, we got several who are traveling tonight. God, you'd give them traveling mercies, and several, Lord, that were providentially hindered that wanted to be here and Lord circumstances held them away God I pray for them God for the next few minutes I pray that the word of God would become alive to us I pray that you'd help and refresh your people many have labored hard this week on their jobs and Lord they face this old wicked world uh, God I pray tonight you'd do something special for them I pray you'd send a little reviving to our hearts uh, God, we certainly pray if there be any amongst us tonight, uh, may even be a church member. I don't know. Uh, Lord, they may be lost without Christ. Uh, I pray tonight that the blinders would be removed from their eyes. Uh, they'd see their lost condition uh, and come to Christ before it's everlasting too late. Uh, Father, use this unworthy vessel. Glorify your namesake. Uh, Father, we'll thank you for it. Uh, thank you for all the good testimonies uh, Thank you for hearing and answering prayer. Uh, and thank you for being a great God. Uh, thank you for being our God. Uh, bless now, for it's in Jesus' holy and wonderful name uh, we ask these things. Uh, 
Amen and amen. I want you to notice first of all, if you will, in verse number one, uh, the well-beloved. It said, the elder unto the well-beloved Gaius. Gaius is well-beloved. Uh, did you ever meet somebody that uh, nobody liked? Well, that wasn't this guy. Everybody liked this guy. Listen, I'm telling you, I know we're supposed to love everybody, but there's sometimes you just have personality conflicts and you just don't really get along with somebody. That's not Gaius. Gaius is well-beloved. Everywhere he went, people just loved him. Uh, uh, and I find out a little bit in this chapter why he's well-beloved. Uh, notice his character in verse number 5. Uh, he said, Beloved, thou doest faithfully uh, whatsoever thou doest to the brethren uh, and the strangers. Uh, can I say he's well-beloved because he's no respecter of persons. His character shows uh, whether they were saved or lost, uh, he treated people good, and he was kind to people, uh, and he just uh, 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 helped people no matter what their condition. Uh, he's well-beloved because of his character, uh, but we also find he's well-beloved because of his charity. Look in verse 6. Uh, he said, which have borne witness... Uh, of thy charity uh, before the church. Uh, he was a charitable fella. This fella, I believe you could say, uh, he'd give you the shirt off his back. Uh, I mean, he's a giving fella. Uh, he not only uh, 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 cared about people, he put uh, a little bit behind it, and he showed charity, and he was good to people. Uh, uh, he's well-beloved because of his character and because of his charity, uh, but also because of his custom or his patterns or traits. Look what it says again in verse 6. Uh, he goes on to say, Whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, uh, thou shalt do well, because that for his name's sake they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. Uh, we therefore ought to receive such, uh, that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. Uh, uh, can I say that uh, in his traits, in his patterns he showed a life uh, where he depended on God and he was good to others uh, and he had a testimony uh, 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 of such it was his custom and we see that this man uh, is well beloved uh, not only the well beloved notice uh, uh, John has well wishes for him look if you, if you will in, in, in verse number 2 he says beloved I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth John had well wishes for the well-beloved. He said, I, I, I'm praying that you prosper. Uh, I'm praying that you be in good health uh, and that no matter what you touch, it prospers. Uh, have you ever seen that somebody, no matter what they did, uh, it seemed like God blessed it and they prospered? Uh, that's what John's wishing upon this guy. Mm. He's wishing well wishes for Gaius. He's well-beloved. We see the well wishes but notice that Gaius, you know, he was just well done. Everything was just well done in his sight. He did all things well. Uh, uh, look in verse 3. Look what it says. For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. He was uh, uh, well done. He, 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 he had the truth in him, and he walked in the truth. Hmm? Can I say... What better can be said of you and that you walked according to the Bible? Hmm? Well, I bet a lot of people say they're Christians. They don't walk according to the Bible. Hmm? But can I say Gaius did? He had the truth in him, and he walked in the truth. He was well done. I mean, he just did it right. Hmm? Well, I, I got to looking at all this. In this chapter, in this book, Third John, you find the word truth six times. You also find the word true, but you find the word truth six times. And can I say if you're a student of the Bible, six is always referred to as the number of man. Can I say in this chapter, in this book, you find three men... Their names are mentioned. These men are mentioned in this chapter. With all that in mind, this is what I want to preach on. I want to preach on two warriors and a wolf. Two warriors and a wolf. I was going to entitle this, 
two out of three ain't bad, but Miss Annette hates the word ain't, so I know better than use it. And I was fearful if I named this two out of three ain't bad, Brother Adrian have a flashback back to meatloaf, and then, uh, you know, it'll all be gone, back to his, uh, his days back in, and, you know. So I didn't want to take him back there. Kids, you have to Google meatloaf. I mean, you know, that's, that's the only thing I can tell you there, huh? Uh, isn't that bad? My day, we had meatloaf. Their generation, they got somebody called Jelly Roll. I mean, isn't that terrible? I kept thinking, what in the world's a jelly roll? And then on, I was watching the news the other night, and they, he was, I guess, in Cincinnati, and they flashed over to him, jelly roll has eaten a lot of jelly rolls. He weighs about 600 pounds. But anyway, Amen. I want to preach on two warriors and a wolf. And by the way, John calls these men by name. We live in a day and age where you say, Preacher, you can't call names. You can't say anything bad about somebody. You can't call Joe Olstein's name, and you can't call Joyce Meyer's name, and you can't call Popoff's name, and you can't call this one's name and that one's name. You can't call names. Well, can I say John did? Can I say the Apostle Paul did? Can I say that Peter called out Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts, and Luke wrote it down? Hmm? And can I say this? Jesus called names. Hmm? So how come we can't call names? i tell you why people don't want to call names, because they're sissies. Kids, Google that word too, sissies. You're not allowed to use it anymore. Uh, but uh, uh, can I say there's nothing wrong with calling names? I remember a time when they'd call you out from the pulpit. Huh? Oh, yeah. I, I, I remember... <laughs> I remember, I remember preachers calling people down in the, in the pews and naming their sin. Amen. Say, what happened? Did people get mad? There was a whole lot of revival back then. Huh? Amen. I mean, Jesus called people out and called their sin. Huh? Well, see, we don't live in that day and age anymore because everybody's got their feelings on the shirt sleeve. Huh? I have read after men that, I mean, could not survive today. Everybody ever hear of Cyclone Mac McKenzie? Cyclone Mac got his name because he's preaching a tent revival in this valley, and all of a sudden a, a tornado come down through the valley and was headed right toward the tent, and he went outside the tent, got to pray, and then the tornado changed directions, and after that he got the name Cyclone, Cyclone Mac McKenzie. And he was an old, old-fashioned, just revival preacher, preached tent revivals everywhere, and, and there was a, a, a night where he was... Uh, uh, preaching and a lady had been coming to tent revival and she came uh, one night and she had a, had a black eye and come to find out her husband told her if she went back to that tent re uh, revival he's going to kill her he was drunk didn't like her going down there around them church folks and didn't like her being under that tent and hearing all that preaching and then and he beat her up and told her if she went back he's going to kill her well she came on anyway well, Cyclone Max in a big way preaching. I mean, a big way preaching. All of a sudden, that guy come in. He's drunker than a skunk. Come in and wanted to grab his wife and take her out of there. Well, Cyclone Mac, without missing a beat, down out of the pulpit and beat the daylight out of the guy, threw him down in the front row in a chair and told him to sit there. Well, he sobered up while Cyclone Mac was preaching and ended up getting born again that night. Amen. Now, I'm not going to beat anybody up tonight. Because I'm too old. And I'm not Cyclone Mac McKenzie. But I'm just trying to tell you, we've come to a day and age where people are so afraid to offend people, they don't even preach the Bible anymore. Listen, if you stand on this Bible, if you walk according to this Bible, and if you preach or teach this Bible, guess what? You're going to offend people. Because this Bible tells us what sin is. And this Bible tells us what it takes to be saved. Uh, and this Bible makes very clear what God expects. He expects holiness. Amen. And we don't like that kind of preaching. You know what we like? We like self-help preaching. We like preaching that tells us how to have more money in our, IR, our 401ks and our IRAs. And we like preaching that tells us uh, uh, how, to, how to you know look better so we can move out to pews and have aerobics in the sanctuary and all. We don't want Bible preaching. The Bible says in the last days there will be a famine for the hearing of the word of God. Right, 
and we're living there. But in this, in this chapter, we find two warriors and a wolf. Now, I want you to notice, first of all, we've already mentioned it, verse number 3. Notice the warrior, or the man that walked in truth. Verse 3 says, For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. Uh, can I say that he walked in truth? Uh, can I say that he was sound in his doctrine? He was established. Uh, he was not tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Uh, he knew what he believed. He believed the truth. Uh, and he built his life uh, around the truth. He was sound uh, in what he believed. Uh, I remember a day when people told you as Baptist, you knew what they believed. Uh, but as we sit here tonight, there's some 50 different Baptist denominations, uh, and a lot of them don't believe the truth. Uh, a lot of them don't have a sound foundation. Uh, a lot of them uh, are built on shifting sand, uh, and that's why they're doing away with their pulpits. Uh, that's why they're doing away with preaching. Uh, that's why they're doing with old-fashioned worship, uh, uh, because uh, they have no sound foundation. Uh, hey, listen, uh, you build your life on this book, uh, on the Word of God, uh, and let the winds blow. Uh, let the floods come. Uh, let the everything come against you. Uh, your foundation will stand true uh, because it's forever settled in heaven. Uh, we find that he walked uh, in truth. He was sound. He was established. Can I say this? He was steadfast. He was faithful. Didn't say he occasionally walked in truth. He said he walkest in truth. That's a progressive term saying that he constantly was in the truth. He walked in truth. Hmm? Didn't say he sat down one day and quit walking in truth. He walked in truth. He was steadfast. Thank God for folks that are steadfast. Thank God for looking around here. There's folks been in this church over 20 years. What a blessing. Huh? Clint's been here over 50 years. I don't know how old you are. You'll never admit your birthday, but you're old. <laughs> say, preacher, how can you say that? Because I'm old. Uh, I just thank God for people that have been steadfast. A lot of you have been saved a long time. That's a blessing. It's a blessing you're saved, and on a Wednesday night, you're in church. What a blessing. Mm, a lot of places don't even have church anymore on Wednesday night. Listen, I need Wednesday night service. Wednesday night helps me get to Sunday. Are you listening? To, oh, thanks be unto God for folks that are just steadfast. They're just faithful. Mm. If he's in you, you can't help but be faithful. Because uh, that fire she sang about. You can try and douse it out, but you can't douse it out. Yeah. I want to be faithful. Yeah, amen. A lot of things I can't be, but I want to be faithful. Yeah. When Jesus comes, I don't want to have to be sheepish around him because, you know, like Peter was when Peter, you know, denied him. He didn't want to face the Lord. I don't want to be that way. Uh, I want to be faithful. Well, he walked in truth. He was sound. He was steadfast. But he was also sustained. He was uninterrupted. He stayed true to the truth. Un uninterrupted. What a blessing. What a blessing for folks that just stay true. Huh? We live in a day and age where it's real popular to, to shift gears. To change. To apologize for how we were raised up. Uh, these recovering fundamentals. Can I help you something? I'm not recovering for anything. Jesus saved me 49 years ago, and I ain't got over it yet. Hmm? Uh, I don't apologize for the way I break. I don't apologize for the preaching I've sat under. I don't apologize for great men of God that helped shape me and mold me. I don't apologize for any of them. I'm thankful for it all. Amen. Uh, uh, I, I've, I've read this a couple times about the Amish people. And they talk about, you know, how do you keep your young people when you live in, a, in an environment where you don't have any game systems or any telephones or any modern technology? And any, how do you keep your young people? And the Amish fellow said, well, we lose a few, but they eventually all come back. So why is that, 
They said, because they see what happens to your young people. Mm -mm. Huh? Listen. I have nothing to apologize for because God's been good to me. And I'm not looking for anything else. I'm looking for Him. If anything, I need to draw closer to Him. He said, draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to you. I need more of Him, a whole lot less of me. We find that Gaius walked in truth. There's another man mentioned here. He would be the one that we'd refer to as the wolf. Look with me in verse number 9. It says, And I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes. Can I say that Gaius walked in truth, Diotrephes withstood the truth. Look what he says, verse number 9. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. We find this wolf withstood the truth. His name's Diotrephes. And could I say some things about Diotrephes? Because listen, I've been a pastor a long time. I've got friends who've been pastors a long time. And if you've ever pastored any length of time at all, you'll run into Diotrephes. Hmm? Now, listen, I would to God that everybody came to church, had a halo, and everybody came for the right reason. And can I say, for the most part, most people do come for the right reason. Most people want to come and worship the Lord. Most people adore the Lord. Most people want to thank the Lord for how good He's been to them. Most people want to bless the Lord. Most people want to get some help for their life from the Word of God. And most people enjoy fellowshipping with the saints of God, and they come for the right reasons. But there's... One every now and then it'll slip in. And to be honest with you, Brother Tony, you've seen this a lot. Usually the diatrophy is the one that's been there the longest. And he gets it in his mind that he owns the church. We'll call him Eddie Wilson. Huh? No, I'm just teasing, Colonel. Hadn't picked on you all day. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. Huh? But notice some traits about Diotrephes. Can I say that Diotrephes, first of all, wanted the preeminence? Look what it says in verse number 9. It says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. He wanted the preeminence. What does that mean, preacher? He wanted prominence. He wanted to be seen. Can I say the one who is to be seen is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is to receive all honor and glory in the church. Hmm? He's the one that paid for the church. He's the one that established the church. He's the one that commissioned the church. Uh, he's the one that loved the church and gave himself for it. He's for the church. Uh, and listen, uh, the church ought to be for Jesus. But occasionally you'll get somebody who wants to be seen. If they testify, they'll never say with the Lord. They always say, I, 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 me, 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 me. I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. I did. Be honest with you, I don't really care about what you did. Tell me what Jesus did. Hmm? He wants to be seen. Wants to make certain if he gives a dime, everybody knows it. Wants to make certain if he does anything around the church, everybody knows it. You know what the Lord is looking for? He's looking for servants. He's looking for folks who don't care about being seen. You know, uh, the, the average church, 90% of the work's done by 10% of the people. In a lot of instances, most of the work is done by the pastor and his family. And that's why a lot of times when the pastor's family gets of age, they're no longer in church because they got burnt out having to do everything. I, I, I'm so thankful for our church. I don't know what the percentage is, but there is so many people doing something 
You know, we're probably 40, 50, 60. Per, I don't know. I never figured it out because I'm not that good in math. I have to get Sydney to do it. She's the, she's the math witch. But we've got so many people doing things. And the blessing is, Miss Brittany, most people never see it. But we see the effects of it. Most people aren't here seeing who cleans the toilets. But you're sure appreciative when you go into a clean bathroom when you've got to use the bathroom. Most people aren't here seeing who's uh, vacuuming the carpet and who's uh, changing the filters and the air conditioning and who's mowing the lawn and who's working the flowers and who's putting the, uh, the mulch out and who's doing this and who's doing... We don't see all the work getting done, but hey, aren't you glad it gets done? We see all the effects of it. Uh, I preached years ago in the old building about uh, a fellow by the name of Josiah. Nobody ever saw him. Uh, uh, he had a job in the basement of the temple. Uh, there was a... a command of God that the light was to never go out in the temple uh, and can I say they didn't have electricity uh, the light uh, 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 was kept by the oil in the lamps uh, and there was old Josiah in the basement he, I preached on the feller in the cellar nobody ever saw him uh, he's down there squashing those olives uh, getting that oil getting it ready and getting it prepared uh, and when people came the lights were always on uh, they never saw him but they saw the effect of all his labor uh, Aren't you glad for that crowd who doesn't care about being seen? Uh, they just want to serve the Lord. Uh, they just want to do something for Jesus. Uh, and we come out and enjoy the good services uh, because of all the labor that's been done that's unseen. I've learned this. The preacher always gets too much credit or too much blame. What a blessing to have folks that labor for the Lord. That's not diatrophies. Diotrophy wants in. Everybody know what they did. Mm. Can I say he wants the prominence? Can I say preeminence also means he wants power? He wants a position. He wants to be heard. I'll never forget one time we had a fellow visiting. I knew his brother. His brother was a good man of God. And we was in the old building. He, he's visiting. Wasn't real happy at his church because of some changes they were doing. And he came, and he was a deacon at his church, Brother Adrian. And he came a couple services. He wanted to meet with me and ask me a few questions about what we believe. And then he, then he got down to the real reason. He said, how many deacons do you have? I knew what he meant, Brother Aaron. I said, I got two, and I'm not looking for any more. Never saw him again. No. Uh, there are some people, all they want is a position. They want a little piece of the pie. They want some power. They want to be heard. They want to be made to feel like they're somebody. Do you realize what the Bible said about us? We've been made kings and priests in Christ Jesus. It don't get any more higher than that. You've been you getting granted the position of a king in the Lord Jesus. Uh, you're a priest. Uh, uh, you can directly go to the Lord. You don't have to go to an earthly priest. Uh, and you've been made to rule and reign over your flesh. Uh, what a blessing to be a king and priest in Him. Uh, I, I don't deserve anything. All I deserve is what she sang about, hell. Uh, but I'm not going to hell because of what the Lord done for me. Uh, hey, uh, what a blessing seem to be saved tonight uh, but the Diotrephes wants some power wants the prominence he also wants praise he wants to be adored he wants everybody to pat him on the back that's what preeminence means he's always constantly wanting attention hmm? we see that he withstood the truth he wanted preeminence, but he not only wanted preeminence. We also find this wolf was found prating. Look again in verse number 10. John says, Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth. John sounds like a man's man to me. Hmm? i got to say this. I was preaching revival a couple weeks ago. Y'all were praying for me down there in Quincy, Florida. And I got to preaching somehow on men's men, you know. I picked out one guy and a fella, and you could tell he was a hunter, fisherman. Oh, I had him, man. I had him. I hooked him. I picked him, man. And I got because I didn't know nobody there. I'd never been there. And then I was telling him how he's a man's man. I'm slapping him on the shoulder. I had no idea. He just had shoulder surgery. And I'm just, you know, everybody, 
He, he, didn't even, he didn't even grunt. I mean, he was a man's man. But I got a big way of preaching about men's men, you know, give us some John Waynes and this day and everything. Well, another fellow over on the other side, he, he did, just did some special singing. The next night he said, the preacher, I got to tell you this. He had a little bitty old boy, a little old towhead boy. And he said, we got all my boys. I want to watch a movie. He said, what movie do you want to watch? He said, I'm thinking, you know, whatever they watch now, Barney or Disney or whatever. He said, I want to watch John Wayne. I said, hey, man, show that boy some John Wayne movies. Show him some El Dorado or something, yo. That'll help that boy, huh? Listen, John here sounds like a man's man. He said, I'm going to remember him when I show up. I'm going to remember his deeds. But look what he says. He says, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words. Not only does this wolf want the preeminence, but he also is found prating. What does that word mean? Prating against us with a malicious word. Well, that, that word prating means speaking falsely. Mm, some inauthentic statements or statements that are not true. You've heard me say this many times. You can defend anything but a lie. Can I say, John being away when he's inspired to write this letter to send to, the, to, to Gaius and his congregation, when the man of God's away, it's amazing what people say. But they won't say it to his face. Hmm? If you can't say it to his face, you ought not be saying it behind his back. John said he's been using prating about with malicious words against us. He's been speaking falsely. But that not only means falsely, it means frivolously. It means insignificant or not important. Hmm? It amazes me how many people waste so much time with things that are not important. What we ought to all keep at the forefront from our mind, a hundred years from now, most of what we do is not even going to matter. But he's frivolous, he's false, and is speaking against John. But that word prating also means foolishly. It means ignorant, not researched. Years ago, we had a diatrophies here. And he'd go in, in secret and, and try to manipulate people and talk people against me. But I have made this statement, Brother Jim. I ain't made it in a long time because, you know, hallelujah, we got folks that aren't diatrophies. But I used to have to make this statement. If I've made a statement and it's not biblical, if you show me that I'm wrong, then I will gladly stand up and recant it and apologize for not speaking the truth. And Brother Ron, it's amazing how many people talk bad about you, but they'll never take a Bible and show you where you're wrong. Hmm? I know you've never had that happen. No, never. Hmm? Uh, no, that's why you don't have hair on top anymore. Huh? Yeah, it might be. Huh? But see, uh, there are some people that say foolish things. I'll give you an example about the diatrophies that was here. Diatrophies that was here went to one person in the church and said, wouldn't it be wonderful if we saw more people saved? Well, we would all say amen to that, wouldn't we? Well, then he went to someone else and said, well, I've been talking, we've been talking over there, and, and Brother Doug's not a good enough pastor around here because not enough people are getting saved. You say, what was going on? He wanted the preeminence. Hmm? We see that he not only wanted the preeminence, he not only spoke with prating words, but he also was prejudiced. Look at verse number 10. What it says, he said, prating against us with malicious words. This says, and not content therewith. He said, that, that wasn't it. He said, it would be one thing if he stopped there. But he wasn't content stopping there. He takes it a step farther. Look what he says. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and cast them out of the church. 
He's picking and choosing who's allowed to be a brother in the church. He said, and if you receive Brother Ron, and Brother Ron's not meeting the, my requirements, then I'm kicking you out. He's prejudiced. Hmm? Aren't you glad God's no respecter of persons? Uh, do you know if the Lord set a standard, we'd none of us make it? Uh, aren't you glad the standard is Christ? And when we're in Christ, we're accepted in the Beloved? Isn't that a blessing? Uh, aren't you glad you're saved? Aren't you glad that the same Spirit that lives inside of other folks that are saved lives inside of you? That's what makes us accepted Him. But this bozo here is prejudiced. He's picking and choosing who we'll even let in the church. And he won't let people that are contrary to what he thinks. He's a wolf. Hmm. Uh, I've seen them. They look down their nose. Oh, that person, you know what they did? You know what they did? You've heard me say it. Anything that feasts on dead things is a buzzard. Hmm? Huh? Aren't you glad that when Jesus forgives us of our sin, he does not remember it against us no more? So if Jesus don't remember our past, why are we letting some buzzard? Hmm? So we've looked at one warrior, we looked at the wolf, let's look at the other warrior. Can I say that Gaius walked in truth? Diotrephes withstood the truth. But we got another fellow who was a witness of the truth. Look with me in verse number 12. Demetrius hath good report of all men and of the truth itself. That's all said about him. But isn't that a mouthful? I mean, this fella, not a whole lot written about him. But what's written about him? What a testimony. He said, Demetrius hath good report of all men and of the truth itself. He was a witness of the truth. It's seen in his disposition. He said, He hath good report of all men and of the truth itself. His very makeup said, saved. When was the last time that somebody didn't know you from Adam come up and said, you're a Christian, aren't you? See, saved people, their countenance should be different than lost people. Now, I know there's some preachers that make it all about what we wear. Can I say, if your countenance isn't right, it doesn't matter what you wear. Hmm? Uh, and the Lord's more interested on the inside, and what He's put on the inside, you work out. That's where Paul wrote about working out your own salvation. But our countenance ought to be different. Hmm? Now listen, we're all made of flesh. Anybody here not made of flesh? Because I want to note you. All right. All right. We're all made of flesh. None of us got a red cape and a yellow S on our chest. Anytime we hear biopsy, the flesh automatically runs to that worry mode. Anytime we get bad news, the flesh gets nervous. That's flesh. That's normal. This crowd that acts like, well, bless God, I never worry about anything. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Amen. Uh, uh, something somewhere along the line is going to cause your flesh to become troublesome. Yeah. But what affects our countenance is when we turn to Psalms 86, or whatever psalm she said she turned to, and you get a promise you can lay your head down at night on that promise. And that puts all that worry and that fear in its rightful place. Huh? That lets that inward man rise up and you put that fleshly man under subjection and that'll cause you to press on. 
That'll cause you to have a smile in the midst of your adversity. That'll cause you to have no worry showing on your face uh, when your flesh would be troubled. Uh, why? Because uh, of what the truth in you will do for you. Uh, he has a good report of the truth itself. You can see it in his disposition. Can I say this? You could see it in his duties. He hath a good report of all men. His works showed he was a Christian. Listen, we can all talk about how, how big of a Christian we are. Why don't you show people? Huh? Your works will just speak a whole lot more than your words. Hmm? Uh, James said, I'll show you my faith by my works. Hmm? His duties showed he was a witness of the truth. And then his declaration, his voicing. He told others. He had a good report of all men and of the truth itself. He told all men about how good God was in his life. His declaration of the goodness of God was known because he was a witness of the truth. We live in a day and age where we've gotten so sheepish we forgot to be real sheep. We're so afraid of offending people. We're so afraid of what people may be thinking. We're so afraid. You know what we need to do? We need to let that line of the tribe of Judah within us rise up. We live in a day and age where people want to see something that's real. Now, I'm not talking about being nasty. I'm not talking about being a smart aleck. I'm not talking about being frozen. I'm talking about let them see Christ in us. Folks, what's going on in the Middle East? That all is about ready to fracture big time. And all you hear in America are lies from news media. You see chaos at the Capitol. You see, I don't know where they're getting all these Palestinian people that are, you know, parading in our streets, but they're paying them to do it. Don't these people have jobs? Every day a major city's got, I mean, all these Palestinians. And today, by the way, the capital was overrun with them. None of them got arrested. What are you trying to say, preacher? I'm trying to say this is all orchestrated. They didn't get all these people together overnight. This has all been planned. And this thing is about ready to bust wide open. And we got neighbors and friends and co-workers and classmates and folks that have no idea how close Jesus' is coming is. Right. Can I say you could tell them to go pick up a Bible and read it, but they never will. They need to see the truth in us. They need to hear the truth from us. They need to see something totally different than what they're seeing all around them. They need to see true love. And they need to see Jesus Christ in us. Now, I found this. I'm going to read to you. I'll be done. I found this quote. This quote's by A.W. Tozer. Uh, A.W. Tozer was a, was a great man of God who, who wrote a lot of things that are hard to swallow in this day and age. He wrote about being holy. He wrote about being a light and being a witness. But this is what he had to say. He said, The testimony of a true follower of Christ might well be something like this. The world's pleasures and the world's treasures henceforth have no appeal for me. I reckon myself crucified to the world and the world crucified to me. But the multitudes that were so dear to Christ shall not be less dear to me. If I cannot prevent their moral suicide, I shall at least baptize them with my human tears. I want no blessing that I cannot share. I seek no spirituality that I must win at the cost of forgetting that men and women are lost and without hope. If in spite of all that I can do, they will sin against light and bring upon themselves the displeasure of a holy God, then I must not let them go their sad way, I unwept. I scorn a happiness that I must purchase with ignorance. I reject a heaven that I must enter by shutting my eyes to the sufferings of my fellow man. I choose a broken heart rather than any happiness that ignores the tragedy of human life and human death. Though I, 
through the grace of God in Christ, no longer lie under Adam's sin, I would still feel a bond of compassion for all of Adam's tragic race. And I am determined that I shall go down to the grave or up into God's heaven mourning for the lost and the perishing. You know what will make a difference? If they see we really care. When's the last time you wept over somebody who's lost? When was the last time you was broken hearted for this sin cursed world? Can I say Jesus didn't leave us here to build ministries. He left us here to tell people that Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. They don't have to die and go to hell. He left us here to be witnesses unto him in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the world. He left us here to walk in truth and be a witness of the truth within us. But you see, Brother Donald, every day that we're not a witness, what we really are doing, we're withstanding the truth. We're not sharing it. God help us to be a warrior for Christ. Let's all stand, Brother Clint, if you'll come get a song of invitation. God spoke to your heart. The altars are open. If you're here tonight and you don't know Christ, we'd love to introduce you to him. We'd love to get somebody to take, you, take a Bible and show you how to be saved. You can be saved tonight. The requirement is to realize you're lost. Well, folks are already coming. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we bless you. We thank you for the Bible. Lord, we're thankful for people like Gaius and Demetrius. Lord, I pray for those diatrophies that, Lord, they truly get their hearts right with God, put God first in their life. God, I'm thankful for such a good church you blessed us with. God, help us to shine our light like never before. Lord, I pray for sinners. I pray we'd see them saved. Lord, I pray for those in our communities, those in our workplaces, those in our schoolrooms. God, they'd see a difference in us, and they'd come to trust in Christ. Bless now this invitation. Speak to hearts. And God, get glory to your name. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.